Hello, I'm very excited to have the lovely Conrad Jones back with me. Hi, Conrad, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, hi, um, I'm Conrad. I'm the author of 25 um, thriller novels. I've uh, been around since 2008. Um, just about to release uh, book number 26. Um, they're all thrillers, thrillers, they're all gritty, they're not for the faint hearted. Um, and we've just uh, also just become uh, a publishing house called Red Dragon. Um, so we've got two strings to my bow at the moment. I, I'm an author and a publisher at the moment, so things are pretty busy. And thanks for having me back again. Always a pleasure. I think this is the third time, is it, I've had you? I think probably, fiction? yeah, it's at least three. I think we did a couple through lockdown, didn't we? I think so, yeah, I don't remember. I've done so yeah. many now, they just blur. I've no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, shall we start with books and the new book? Yeah. Do you want me to tell you about it? Go on then, you may as well. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, the new book is called Something Disturbing Happened Today. Um, and it's a, a, an Anglesey murders book. Uh, with the usual detectives and the usual CSIs and so on in there. Um, and it's, it's uh, as the title says, it is what it says on the tin, something disturbing happened today uh, and every day. <laughs> and continues to be disturbing from page one until page 200 and whatever it is uh, long. Uh, but it, it's been a bit of a, um, a different journey writing this book. Um, we started with some building work, uh, which should have been in March, and then it went to June, and then the builders turned up late September uh, and basically took the, the back off the, off the house, which included the kitchen and the boiler. Uh, and we ended up being 20-odd weeks into a six-week project. So we had no kitchen for... 16 weeks, no hot water for eight weeks. Um, of course, the noise and the dust and the mess, it, it played havoc with, um, with, with my karma to sit down and, and start writing. Um, it was an absolute nightmare. I bought a portable pump sprayer, which looked like something that you do your fences with. And, and we were boiling the kettle to fill this thing up to shower um, when we couldn't get round to, to friends and family. Uh, and of course, we're eating takeaways every night and you soon get sick of them. Um, so this book is probably about three months behind where it should have been in the, in the grand scheme of things. Um, and because I've been so unsettled through the journey of writing it, I've had to go back to the beginning so many times now that I could, I could read it word for word. Um, and when it's done, I'll be well and truly sick of it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll never want to see it again. Um, so yeah, it, it's a bit delayed. It, it's it's been very frustrating um, from a business point of view because if you if you get behind with releasing content, then you see your sales start to trail off. You know, it really is sort of you know right, right, publish, repeat. You know that that formula. Um, if you get any of those three things wrong, um, then you know it it really does affect the business. And as much as I'm a storyteller and love being a storyteller and, and and writing books and stuff, it's also about paying the bills, you know, and making making money from it. So um, this one, this one's been a bit special and, and I can't wait to get rid of it. <laughs> so with all of that, what on earth possessed you to decide to set up a publishing house? Yeah, well, I mean, it's <laughs> this this has been um, on my mind since ebooks really took off in 2010. Um, and I could just see that, uh, you know, that there's always been sort of um, online, you know, publishers, independent publishers alongside, you know, the, the big ones. Um, a lot of the big publishers went bust, bust in, the, in the crash. Uh, and that's, that's all because, you know, the, the original sort of traditional method of publishing, everything was done on sale or return basis. Um, and hence, it was so difficult to get work published when it when there was, um, you know, only, the only option was paperback and to go through an agent and a traditional publisher. 
Um, and so the publishers took the, the financial gamble um, with every book that, that they took on, published, released, send them out to the, to the distributors and then the bookstores. Um, and if they don't sell, then they also cover the cost of, of things coming back um, and being returned and a lot of books being pulped. So a lot of the, the big publishers were taken out when Borders went bust and when Woolworths went bust. So I'm going back quite a while there now, but they, they never recovered. And so we were left with a handful of sort of big publishers um, and then a scattering of, of, you know, online publishers. And some of them have been very successful um, and some of them, some of them haven't. Some of them have gone off like fireworks and then, you know, not been there. And it's always been in my mind that um, as an author, I would like to think that um, I understand what authors want from a, from a publisher. Um, and my experience with agents and publishers has been that they haven't got a clue what I want. Um, what I really, really want. <laughs> so, and so it's always been sort of on my mind that um, you know I could do that alongside um, the creative side of it, you know, which is writing my own books, um, and that I would enjoy taking some projects uh, to the market, you know, and and uh, applying my marketing experience to other people's work and and. Uh, and see what happens from there. So it's always been on my mind, um, but the, the big sort of red flag in it all is that the, there's, there's two halves to this process and the other half, apart from marketing um, and designing and so on, is, is the editing side of things. Um, and the edit editing side of these things is so crucial in the fact that, you know, you, you need a commissioning editor um, who can take submissions and read um, you know, enough of a book to have a good feel for whether or not this author is commercial. Um, and really, that's that's the be all and end all of it. You know, is, is this book commercial? You know, could it possibly be a series or even as a standalone? Is it going to make any money? Because there's a significant investment in every novel, you know, before it gets to, to market. Um, and so I was only sort of half of the jigsaw puzzle. So although I had all these good intentions and so on, my, my editing skills and patience um, to read other people's work is zero, basically. You know, it, I find it really difficult to read um, any other fiction uh, unless I'm actually on holiday, you know, on, on, a, on a sunbed in the sun with nothing else to think about. Then I can sit down and read a book. But, you know, apart from that, I really, really struggle. So um, it just so happened that the timing was right um, where my editor... Uh, Emma Mitchell, who runs a Creating Perfection website, um, was was a bit low on on um, work coming in, and so on for one reason and another. Uh, you know, things things were getting slow, uh, and and was talking about you know returning back to the to the workplace, which I think would have been a big loss to um, to the to the publishing side of things. Uh, she, she's very talented uh, and so uh, the two sort of pieces just came together in, in the fact that you know uh, creating perfection was available um, and although you know I'd, I'd always thought about um, maybe including an editor that I've met before online and stuff like that they all seem to be so busy you know that you just couldn't sort of think you know of an opportunity where you could say listen you know do, do you fancy setting up a publishing house and just reading books and, and publishing stuff you know as well as doing your your other work and so anyway the opportunity arose and um, we had a talk about it we we're both very keen um to set up red dragon publishing uh, and so that's what we've done um and we've been inundated with submissions and it's it's uh, incredible the amount of talent that is out there uh, and initially, when we started it, you know, we, we were looking at it, and um, it's amazing how many uh, authors are out there who have written multiple books that you've, you've never heard of. You know, you never hear of these people. You sort of think you'd, you'd get a feel for quality work and that uh, being members of online book clubs and stuff like that, you, you would hear people's names or see their books mentioned and so on and so forth. But there's, there's a lot of, of good stuff which is going under the radar you know and for whatever reason that is that people you know they're okay writing a book um 
they're not so great at the marketing of it, you know, and the, the social media interaction, it's not everybody's cup of tea. And they basically would like um, to hand it all over to somebody who'll go away and do, and do that for them, you know, and hence, uh, you know, publishers come into, into that side of things. So uh, I've been sort of overwhelmed with the, with the amount of good stuff which is, is coming in and it's almost like, oh, yeah, you know, um, this, this is really good. But obviously, you know, you, you'd be snowed under completely, you know, if you took everything. So you, then you've got to go back to um, the pros and cons of, of taking one author over another, over another, you know, and you, and you can see um, where people start closing down the submissions page. You know, I've always wondered, why is he closing his submissions page? And now I understand it. You know, ours has only been up a couple of weeks and I want to close it already. <laughs> I'm seriously thinking if I've bitten off more than I can chew. Um, but, you know, it's all good and it's all very positive. Uh, and and it's, it's going to be exciting, so, you know, the next 12 months, two years. Uh, it, it's, it's given me something else to focus on apart from my own work, you know. And it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's going really well, touch wood. So if anyone is interested in submitting, what genres do you publish and how do they go about submitting? The, the uh, website is Red Dragon Publishing. Uh, and that's, we, we've got a Facebook page, we've got a website and the submissions page is on there, you know, and it, it's, it's, so, it's, it's pretty clear, send a covering letter, um, synopsis, and then the first 5,000 words of, of, the, of the, the project that you, you're pitching. Um, so you can find us on Facebook and on, on the internet. Yeah, from that point of view. Initially, my thoughts were because of um, my marketing footprint, uh, I'm thinking along the lines of, you know, that it needs to be pretty similar to the genre that, that I write. So if we're looking at crime, uh, crime thrillers, uh, the, the grittier, the better. Um, I mean, we've had all kinds of, of submissions, you know, vampires and uh, all kinds of stuff. And, you know, while these things are, are really um, well written, uh, there's some stuff where, you know, I, I wouldn't have a Scooby-Doo, even what genre to put some of these things in, you know. And, and, and it's, it's, it's all very important. You know, if you miss a piece of the, you know, of the process, then marketing these things is a nightmare, you know. And it, I, one of my books is, is called The Journey. Um, and that's about uh, a Nigerian family crossing the sub-Saharan desert to try and get across the Mediterranean, you know, escaping a war zone. Um, and while people really enjoy it and the reviews on it are great, it doesn't really fit into it, into any particular genre. And that's, you know, it sort of fell through the cracks from a marketing point of view. So that's something that I'm sort of ultra aware of is it's got to be really clear which, which genre it sits in. Um, before we can even start to think about, you know, pitching Amazon adverts, Facebook adverts and everything else, because all these things come at a cost, um, you know, and it, if you get it wrong, then you can sit there and throw tennis down the, down the drain. Um, I'm not selling any books, which is what it's all about, you know. Um, if I'm taking on these projects and stuff like that, you know, I feel a responsibility to the author to make sure that they, you know, that they're going to sell some books. So I've got to get the marketing right. So picking that genre... Um, we've, we've got to be careful with it. You know, there's some stuff which crosses the line into, into horror, I would say. Um, you know, and then there's other stuff which, which swings the other way, which are a little bit more mysterious and cosy crime. Um, you know, cosy crime sort of springs to Emmerdale to me. You know, it, it's all a bit, it's, it's, it's all a bit soapy <laughs> um, and, and a bit bland for, for my, for my taste. And yet, you know, I'm, I'm not disrespecting that, that, uh, genre because it's a massive market but I just wouldn't know how to market it um, and it, it's sort of looking at some of the publishers that I've been with along the way um, on my journey as an author I think that's that's a mistake which is often made is people taking you know pretty much anything that's thrown at them uh, which could fit into the crime genre but doesn't you know and, and that's uh, I think that that's a that's a mistake which could easily be made, but we're going to try not to make that. So we're saying sort of crime thrillers, 
Um, we've just looked at one without saying too much about it, which is um, it's based in in the the American South in the in the sixties, the late sixties, um, and it, it, it's a fantastic novel. Um, whether that period of, of history is going to appeal to all crime thriller buffs or not, I'm not sure we get to see that there, but um, it certainly fits into the genre from a writing style and, and what goes on in the book. Um, so we'll see. You know, I think I think it's it's a it's a huge bubble, isn't it? With sort of more bubbles which cross over it. You know, is it a crime thriller or or, or what is it? So that that's all part of the process, really, that we're going to find challenging. And is it three orphans you've signed up already? Or just two? I can't remember. <laughs> I'm sorry, can you? Is it three or two authors you've got signed up already? Oh, no, we've got many more than that. Oh, OK. Yeah, we've got many more than that. Yeah, we're, Three we're that you've announced him. <laughs> we're approaching double figures. Wow. <laughs> at the moment, we're approaching double figures. And some of these um, guys and girls have got um, multiple titles. Uh, so that's sort of a... From a commercial aspect, you know, it, it, it's uh, if you've got one, two, three books in a series, then you know you, you can put them out quite quickly once they've already been created, um, and then you've got your box sets and and you know your other products which swing off that series and so. So, um, series from my own point of view, commercially, have been sort of the make or, or break of me continuing to write full time. Um, you know, people like series. You know, it, it's, a, it's a commercial model which has worked over and over again. You know, Lee Child is the classic, you know, series writer. You know, he, he writes about one character, boom, you know, however many times. Um, and people love it. So, you know, crime, crime series, uh, they're, they're a hot, hot product. Um, and there's, there's, I'm surprised at how many of them that are out there. Um, which are coming along and knocking on the door, you know, and as I say, there's some very talented writers out there. So keep your eye on, on Red Dragon because we're going to have some seriously good series coming out in the next 12 months. As soon as I saw it and I saw who was behind it, I'm like, oh my God, that's awesome. It's going to be amazing. So. Oh, that's very, very kind excited. of you to say so. Thank you. And, and thank you for your confidence in our ability to do that. I think, I think we've, we've, we've got a head start. Um, in the fact that, you know, the, the background of writing and creating um, on my own and with publishers, you know, and in partnership with, with editors and so on. Uh, and then obviously having a great editor like Emma on board along there. And, um, she seems to have a knack for picking, um, you know, what, what's commercial and what isn't, you know, and it's, uh, it, that, that's all, all key to sort of putting good products out there. So I, I think, we, we, you know, we, we know what we're talking about. Um, the actual publishing side of it is probably the easiest part um, of the process. You know, getting get a book to market, um, you know, it's not rocket science, um, but, you know, it, it's been proven time and time again that it can be done badly. Um, and this is where authors and, and readers, have, have, you know, have a poor experience. Uh, and we're going to try and avoid that. You know, obviously, we're going to, we're, we're going to, come across some hurdles, you know, and we're going to make some mistakes, obviously, but um, hopefully we're, we're well armed enough you know, up, up here to, to do it the right way. Yeah. And um, when I interview people, your name is one that's frequently mentioned in doing self-publishing, right? You're used as an example quite often. So you've got that in your favour before you even start. <laughs> oh, really? What do they say? <laughs> <laughs> you have to watch my interviews and then you'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I do. When you when you pop up on Facebook, um, I do get distracted quite often by your uh, by your interview. An interview will pop up and I'll go, who's, who's that? And I, and I don't know who that is. Um, and of course, the the, the we've, we've had a couple of years where we've not been able to go to Harrogate and meet up and um, you know meet other authors who've not met, met before in the pub. Um, you know, so it, it's uh, watching some of your interviews. I think, go, ah, right, that's that so and so. I can put a face to a name with some of your interviews, yeah. And I get distracted, and then I think, bloody hell, this, this book could come out so much quicker if I could get off Facebook. <laughs> I know 
my my whole life is on Facebook. Like my, I think I'm approaching 100, 250 interviews now. That's incredible. This is my second today. Then I've got two tomorrow, I think. It's nuts. It's, it's a fabulous platform that you're offering to people, you know, and, it, and it's... Um... I, I, you, you just literally couldn't put a figure on, on how many authors you've helped to sell how many books, you know, because these things, you know, people will, will listen to what people are saying and they'll go away and have a look. You know, they might not always buy a book, but, you know, some will. Uh, you know, when, you, when you're doing that many, I mean, you must be responsible for, for selling thousands of, of, uh, of people's books. And, that, you know, and that's giving people who, who don't have the opportunity to, to talk about the themselves and the writing you know you're giving them a great platform uh, to put yourself on so long may you continue to do your what you do and when I you get to choice. a thousand <laughs> we need to have a massive big party <laughs> yeah well people have booked until november i really? have no choice yeah wow. so i've got to be doing this till at least november and then no doubt someone will start asking for later so yeah actually three three people have asked for november wow i'm wow. like Probably, like yeah, I'm, sure. I'm going to be mentioning your name to uh, to Red Dragon authors, and I'm going to be saying you need to have a word with this lady and see if she wants to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want to talk to anyone. I want to hide <laughs> in a dark room and rock. Oh, well, well, we'll get you some more. We'll get you towards that 300 mark very quickly. <laughs> yeah, it won't take long, I don't think. <laughs> uh, what was I just going to ask you as well? I can't remember. I'm going to ask you some of my fun questions that I've created since I last spoke to you because I have new questions. Okay. <laughs> um, if you were to fictionally kill someone, how would you do it? If I was going to fictionally kill someone? <laughs> yeah. What, in a book? Yeah. Oh, God. If you were going to do it, not a character, but you. Oh, right. Because <laughs> um... obviously you've done it loads of times. Yeah, God, I've, I've, I've run out of ways to do it, to be honest. I do run out of ways to do it. And then sometimes I have to stop and think, I've never done that before. You know, and it's, uh, it's difficult to, to pick from a chaotic mind whether I've seen it on TV or whether I've just thought of it or whether maybe I've read it before. Um, so it, it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult one. It's a very difficult one. I'm a big fan of... Um, killing people in my head and making sure that I don't get caught. So um, it, it would be something which involved um, not being discovered. So you know, you're coming from a, a, an island, the sea springs to mind. <laughs> uh, and turning people into fish food. Yeah, de <laughs> definitely, definitely somewhere where there's absolutely no trace. And if you were fictionally murdered, who would you want to investigate your case? Oh, God. Um, that's a good question. I know. <laughs> it is a good question. Who would have, and, and I suppose the outcome that you're asking me is who's, who's going to be the best person to, to catch the killer? Yep. Yeah. God, there's, there's so many, isn't there? There's so many. Um, I think I'm a, I'm a big fan of Frost and Morse um, and Rebus. Uh, I quite like all those sort of TV type um, detectives. Uh, but I think my favourite was probably Rebus, so it'd have to be him. Um, and if you were to team up with your head detective with another fictional detective to solve an unsolved crime, who would you choose and what crime would you choose? I think it would have to be um, whichever fictional detective sells the most books so that <laughs> I could make lots of money out of it. So I'd probably team them up with Jack Reacher um, or who's the one Patterson does, what's his name? He does a few actually, he's got quite a few series. Yeah, he has, hasn't he? He has. I can't remember his detective, but it would have Neither to be somebody... Team up with somebody who's already extremely rich. Definitely. 
what crime I'm not, I'm not going to go for the arty answer there or say Sherlock Holmes <laughs> or anything like that. It, it would be the detectives would sell the most books. <laughs> well, you I'll know, someone else that. said that. <laughs> yeah, put for the choice. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you were to take one of your characters out for a meal, who would you choose? And what oh, would you it would ask have them? To be, um, it would have to be Fabienne. Um, and she's always the baddie uh, in, in a lot of the darker books, Fabian. It would have to be it would have to be her because she's the most interesting. And I'd have to keep my eye on my food and my drink and everything else. Uh, because but I'd also think that she'd be the most fun. Yeah, so she she's a particular favourite um character without a doubt. Uh, also the, the detective in the Anglesey books is um Alan Williams. Detective Alan Williams and Alan uh, in real life wasn't a detective at all. He was an architect, and he was my brother-in-law. And we we, we became good friends when he started dating my sister when I was sixteen. Um, and unfortunately, he's not with us anymore. Hence, he's he's in a series of books. But if I could take him out for a meal one more time, that would be great. And um, if you're able to spend a day with any author, dead or alive, who would you like to spend a day with? I think I, when I, I get asked this question, there's, there's two people that spring to mind. One, Stephen King, and the other one's it's James Herbert. Um, and I would I would swing towards James Herbert purely and simply because he, he, his writing was more UK based and um, written in a little bit more of the language that I understood as a, as a teenager when I read the Rats trilogy and so on. And is that was the author who I was always constantly waiting and looking at the bookshelves to see when his, his new book would come out. Um, and it, it's uh, his writing style absolutely fascinated me and frustrated me in the fact that I could never find out what happened at the end of the chapter at the beginning the next one he used to drive me insane especially when I was tired if I had school the next day or you know when, if I was going to work and I got a bit older um, and when I started writing I very much tried to emulate that style of writing where you keep people turning the, the pages so if you leave a, a chapter on a bit of a cliffhanger you can't just read the half of the next page, you know, to find out what happens. It's not there. It's in chapters further on. Um, but it, his style of writing and his, his use of words and English language and so on, I think it just fascinated me, but didn't baffle me. You know, I never had to go away and look up a word. You know, he used very simple language um, and just then thrown me all the way through my early years of, of reading books and stuff. You know, and it, his writing... Um, made me enjoy reading much more than the stuff that school gave me to read. Um, you know, they, they were dreadful. Uh, even though some of them were classics, they were awful. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, it would be James Herbert. Yeah, good choice. The Rats trilogy is one of the best things I've ever read, even now, so... Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And I think that, uh, unusually, I think they got better um, as each one went along. Um, so it's the rats, the lair, and then domain, wasn't it? Was the, was yep. the last one. And if anybody's not read them, um, it's not horrific enough for you to to not be able to read it. If you like dark, gritty thrillers, you, you can read that uh, trilogy, uh, and it is fantastic. It, it leaves you sort of breathless in some places. The tension um, that he builds up is is fantastic. He, he had a skill for building tension. Um, building up characters so that you really invested in them, and then, boom, they were gone. You know, it was like like Game of Thrones. <laughs> you, <laughs> you get invested in a character or a family, and then wham, you know, they've all been eaten by rats. He, he was very, very talented at that. But that's a great trilogy, uh, and it's something that um, I've often thought in my head. I wonder if I if I could sit down and write the fourth. You know, if he, if he was alive today, if I phoned him up and said, James, I want to do the fourth rats, well, what do you think? Um, I would love to sit down and have a go at that. I would love to. I don't think I'd be able to, to match him, but I think I could certainly have a lot of fun trying. <laughs> Definitely. Um, what's the strangest or funniest place you've ever woken up? What's that, sorry? What's the strangest or funniest place you've ever woken up? Oh, now then, there's several of them. <laughs> there's several of them. Um, I would have to say I woke up once on a tugboat 
in, in the Conway Harbour. Um, and I wasn't just on the tugboat, I was in a bunk in the tugboat. And it was like the Marie Celeste, there was nobody else on the tugboat apart from myself. Um, and I was actually going there. I actually went to Conway um, with my girlfriend at the time. Um, and it was, it was like, a, a, you know, I think we were late teens, early 20s or something like that. And it, it was a stupid anniversary, like, you know, 52, 52 weeks since we'd met or something like that. She decided it was an anniversary date and off we went to Conway. Um, and we had a, a massive row and she went home on the train uh, and I ended up on a tugboat the next day. And to this day, I still don't know how I got on the tugboat. Um, and I struggled to get off it because we were actually in the harbour. Um, and I had to shout out to a nearby boat and they came along with a, with a, a rowing boat and took me back to, to shore. Um, and I had some interesting questions from a policeman uh, as to what I was doing on the tugboat and how I got there. And I, I just couldn't, I, I really, really couldn't remember being there. So that, that was a disgraceful episode, but um, still a mystery. <laughs> I'm assuming lots of alcohol was consumed beforehand. You what, sorry? I'm assuming lots of alcohol was consumed beforehand. Absolutely there was, yeah. Far, far too much, far too much. <laughs> But I think in in those days when you're young, you know, you you you, you think you can drink um, far more than you actually can. I think it's only as you get older you realise that you know you you do have a tolerance level, and it's best to stay beneath it. Um. So yeah, that was that was sort of a one of those wild, stupid things that you do when you're young. Um. Well, I'm conscious that you were on a time limit, so I don't have any more questions, I don't think, unless you'd like to remind everyone about the new book, when it's coming out, where they can get it, etc. Brilliant, yeah. The new book is called um, Something Disturbing Happened Today, uh, and it should be out uh, towards the end of, of February, with a bit of luck. Um, I'm not going to do a, a, a massive pre-order on it, so it, it, it'll be out shortly before it actually gets launched uh, this time. Well, yeah, but there's, there's 24 more out there if you're interested. There's 24 <laughs> more, sorry, 25 more out there. So go and have a look at them while you're waiting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll promote it in my group on release day anyway, so everyone will know. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. And Thanks for having me again. You're very welcome. A pleasure as always. Bye-bye. Speak to you soon.